All right, if you guys want to come on in and grab a seat, we're going to get started here. Uh, for those new, as I mentioned, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm one of the staff here at Centerpoint. Uh, not a typical preaching staff, but every now and then, uh, when they get desperate, they call on me. So it's probably been about a, a year or so since I've preached. So uh, it was interesting, actually, as I was prepping my message, uh, I kind of tend to just type and type and at the end cut stuff out. And then yesterday, I, I printed it off for the first time. I typically just kind of read it from my screen, and I printed it off, and it was more than eight pages. So... Uh, We'll see what happens today. Uh, I never thought that I was a long-winded guy, but uh, maybe today we'll give Josh and Howie a run for their money. Not likely, though. Those guys can go on forever. Why don't we pray? We're going to get started. God, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. Uh, God, it challenges us. It grows us. Guides us. So, God, be with us today. Guide my words. Let them be your words. In Jesus' name. Going to throw some things at you guys here, and we'll see, uh, see how you are on your, your history. Have you guys ever heard the following? Applaud, my friends, the comedy is finished. Anyone know who said that? Applaud, my friends, the comedy is finished. That was Beethoven's last words before he died. Uh, George Harrison is another one. He said, love one another. That's a great one. Uh, Winston Churchill, his, his last words on his dying bread, uh, bed, I'm bored of it all. How's that? I am bored of it all. Winston Churchill, even, at that. Uh, Steve Jobs, for those of you who are familiar with him, uh, he was the founder of Apple. Uh, his, I like his, actually. It's, it's so bizarre. It's just, oh, wow. That's it. This profound man who created this billion-dollar company and his final last words were, oh, wow. John Lennon, another one. I'm shot. Nice and easy. Uh, Elvis Presley, a lot of you will be familiar with him. Uh, he says, I hope I haven't bored you. How's that? Famous last words is what we're talking about today. But why are anyone's last words famous? What is it about someone's final words that really does fascinate us, causes us to sit up and listen a little closer? I think we can probably all agree that we're just naturally interested in someone's last words because we believe that a person's last words are what it gives us a glimpse into their heart. It shows us what's at their very core. And when people are dying, the things that they've, you know, whether, maybe it's the things they always wanted to say or the things that they needed to say but didn't get to. And so we really get to see the, the true heart of a person. If you knew that you only had an hour left to live, what would you want to say? What words would you have for your friends or for your spouse, for your kids, your coworkers, maybe your siblings, your neighbors? What would your last words be to them? Would you open up your heart? Would you say those things that you always wanted to say but never really got around to? Wouldn't you want to leave your family and friends with just an undeniable truth about what was most important to you? About your hopes, your desires, your prayers for each of them. Here's some more famous last words. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Whose famous last words were those? Yeah, Jesus' last words. So this morning, I want us to look together at those famous last words of Jesus. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, we're going to read through verses 16 through 20. These are Jesus' last words. And it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So 
you can imagine the scene here that Matthew's painting for us. Uh, it's just a matter of days after Jesus died on a cross. And you've got these men, these disciples, who, I mean, this was their teacher, this was their rabbi, their friend, for the last little more than three years. And it was just a matter of days since he had been arrested and killed and on, on the cross. And here we have the disciples seeing Jesus again. He's raised from the dead. Verse 17 tells us that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The circumstances are so incredible that there's a mixed response from everyone involved. The reality of Jesus being risen, even though these guys followed him around for three years, they heard his message, they heard the gospel. Despite that, there were still some who weren't quite sure what was going on. But notice how those famous last words reveal to us the true heart of of Jesus. What matters to Jesus? Well, in these words, it's, it's pretty clear. It's an emphasis on continuation of his mission. Jesus doesn't say to them, you know, you guys were great. You're awesome. You know, go on with your life. Doesn't thank them for all the good times they had sharing fish with people. You know, see you guys on the other side sort of thing. No. Instead, Jesus gives them a charge a commission. It's a set of marching orders that he's given them to carry out once he's gone. Matthew 28 is, uh, it's not the only place where we read about Jesus' last words. Uh, here's a few others for those who want to hear them. Uh, Acts chapter 1 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Then we've got John chapter 20. It says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw him. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even I am sending you. And then in Luke 24, it says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So again, as we look at all these different accounts of Jesus' last words, we really see that mission of God. As the Father has sent me, I also will send you. This mission was a, a continuation of the mission of Jesus that he was carrying out while he was here. It was his earthly ministry that he's having them carry out. This was uh, simply a, a new phase of that ministry, if you will, a new phase made possible by Jesus' death and resurrection. That's why he tells them, you shall be my witnesses that's the reason that they can proclaim forgiveness of sins in His name to all nations, because He sent them to do His work. These famous last words of Jesus before He returned to the Father reveal His heart. These words are all about what we are supposed to be doing as His followers. If you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, do these words shape your life? Billions of people around the world, even right now, have the thought throughout their life many days, why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? Many Christians ask that same question, and I think we come up with a lot of different answers to why am I here? You know, I'm, I'm here to be fulfilled. God doesn't want me to be fulfilled? No, of course that's not it. Maybe I'm here somehow uh, just to, to make it through life, to make it through the minefield that we call life. And, you know, we're just here all on that journey. Are these things completely wrong? No, but they're incomplete. These are things that we're here to do. You know, God tells us that we're here to have a life and life to the full, but that's not it. 
I think church has come up with the same question. Why are we here as a church? Why is Centerpoint here as a church? And I think that we also come up with different answers, not incorrect answers, just misdirected answers. You know, we're here to, to get people saved so that they can go to heaven, or we're here to help uh, people solve their problems and deal with all of their baggage, or maybe we're here, uh, you know, to help better our communities, or to give people a good theological education, or provide people with a worship experience, or help people to be healthy and wealthy. You know, these are, are all different things that the churches can say that they're here for. And again, not all of them are entirely incorrect. They're just incomplete. The grace of God at work in the faithfulness of His people is the reason why you're sitting here this morning. This morning, we need to cling to those last words of Jesus. We need to think again about the reason why each of us is here. We need to think about why Centerpoint is here. And then we need to carefully consider that charge of Jesus, the commission that Jesus gave to us. See, the, the 11 disciples, they weren't just functioning as individuals. As the, the leaders of Jesus' people that represented Jesus' people, they represent the church, the mission that's entrusted to the church. So Paul didn't just go off and do his thing on his own. He was a part of this group called the church. If we go to Matthew 28 again, you know, what do we learn about the mission that's been entrusted to us, that every follower of Jesus for every church, what do we discover about the famous last words that should shape all of our lives? The first thing that we see right away is the word disciple. Jesus tells these 11 men to go out and make disciples. So what's a disciple? According to Matthew chapter 10, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. So a disciple of Jesus is someone who is like Jesus. And now back in in this time, back when the disciples were carrying out that mission, the word disciple was one very common to them. It was a very common word, especially in the Jewish culture, uh, you know, from a very young age, meaning before school, uh, kids were, were taught about being a disciple of a rabbi, and they would, you know, spend their, their first five or six years trying desperately to, you know, learn the Torah and learn the words of the Scriptures so that they could then become a disciple of one of the rabbis. So this was a very common word used back then. So they completely understood what was meant when he said, go make disciples. It's not uh, the disconnected kind of information that we see in education models. You know, I, I get a little bit from this teacher, and maybe we'll get a little from this teacher over here, and then we'll kind of stick it all together and come up with something. That's not the, the Jewish version of what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who follows one person, follows one teacher, and in the case of the disciples, these are men who follow Jesus. They wanted to be like Jesus, not above Him, as Matthew 10 says. No different than, you know, if you've got a music teacher, their students want to become like their music teacher. They want to be skilled like their teacher. Or if you're a carpenter, maybe you have an apprentice who studies under you. The, the job of the apprentice is to become like the teacher. And so that's what we have with the disciples. A disciple is someone who is under Jesus with the goal of becoming like Jesus. When we consider the whole Bible, we see that Jesus is simply using that cultural concept that was familiar to His people in order to communicate something that God had said before, even in the Old Testament. God's command in the book of uh, Leviticus tells it best, where He says, in chapter 11, He says, Be holy, for I am holy. He's saying, I want you to be like me. And then later, Jesus would say, Come, follow me. 
Jesus says in this passage, make disciples of all nations. That means all of us are invited to follow. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you used to believe or what you've done in the past. We're all called as followers of Christ to make disciples of the nation. So how do you make a disciple? Seems like a, a big task. Let's make a disciple. So, how did Jesus do it? You know, did he send people to school so that they could be educated in a certain way? You know, do you simply have to say a prayer? Maybe you just say a prayer and now you're, you're all of a sudden you're like Jesus. Anyone here live that? You know, you just said a prayer and you're magically like Jesus? I know I have not. And I'm willing to bet most of you have not as well. We all know that that's not how it works. Notice in verse 19 and 20 of Matthew 28, there's actually two very clear instructions on what is, consi uh, what is considered a, a part of the work of making a disciple. And if I decided to use PowerPoint today, I'm sorry, I'm not big. I know I'm a tech guy, but when I have the opportunity to not use tech, I take it. And so if I was putting this up on the screen, I would say, how do you make a disciple? Uh, so the first and foremost that uh, we read in this passage is baptizing. Go forth into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. A disciple is a man or woman, a boy or a girl, who publicly confirms that they have turned from sin and self to embrace Jesus as Lord and to walk in His grace. We've often, uh, I haven't heard it lately, but I know back kind of when I was in college, we would say that baptism is a outward sign of an inward change. So, first and foremost, baptizing. Make disciples. We have to baptize them. So, that baptism, it's not just, you know, any random person. We're just going to go and dunk them in the water. This is someone who has had that change in their heart. It's a moment uh, in this passage. Baptism is a moment in time kind of indicator of that saving faith. It's not necessarily a, a process. Baptism is just that one-time event that points to a moment that a person first hears the gospel, the good news of Christ. Think about uh, the story of the, uh, the, the, the guard from the jail with, with Paul. You know, this man, uh, what Paul shared the, the gospel with him and with his family, and it says immediately, not just the man, but the whole family was baptized. Not we let them sit on it for 10 years, kind of him and ha about what the gospel is, but they believed, they went to the river and got baptized. You know, Luke in, in Acts 14, we got Paul and Barnabas preaching the gospel in the city uh, and that they made many disciples, the scriptures tell us. That, and so that was, again, they shared the gospel, people responded to the gospel. They were baptized. By announcing the good news about Jesus and because of the faith response of these listeners, Luke can say that Paul and Barnabas made disciples. But does that mean that these disciples, after coming out of the water, uh, were like their teacher in every aspect? No. I know, you know, I, I decided to follow Christ, and a lot of people think I'm going to get baptized, and when I come out of that, everything's going to be different. My life is going to be awesome. Things are going to be great. Many of us know that that's not necessarily true. You know, when you come out of those waters of baptism, that then brings us to the next step in Matthew 28. Verse 20, it says that teaching is a part of making disciples. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the nature of discipleship is not about an automatic conformity to your teacher. It's about learning. The work of making disciples is about teaching these baptized followers of Jesus about what it means to follow Him according to the instructions that Jesus Himself gave. And the commands of Jesus point us to the importance, to the authority of everything that's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So if baptism points us to a moment of conversion, to the point in time in which you go from follower of the world to a follower of Jesus, 
then the work of teaching is going to remind us that making disciples and that discipleship in general is a process. Making disciples is about finding faith and following in faith. It's about birth and growth. It's about opening a door and walking a path. So what about the work of the church and specifically the work of this church? You know, in light of these famous last words, the million-dollar question is, how are you making a disciple for Jesus? How are we as a church making a disciples for Jesus? If we're Christians, then, you know, shouldn't we respond to this change that he gave, or charge that he gave, sorry? Shouldn't we be obeying his marching orders? He told us, or sorry, he told his disciples to teach new disciples to obey everything he commanded. Wouldn't that include the command to go Go forth. That's one of the commands. So who have you guys baptized lately? Who are you teaching these days? We've already pointed out that the, the commission was not given simply to an individual. It wasn't just given to these 11 guys. But rather it was given to these guys who represent the church. The work of making disciples is the work of the church, not just these 11 guys, not just the guys that stand up front. It's the work of the church. Paul confirms this for us in, uh, in what is it, Ephesians chapter 4. He says, Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. Do you see how Paul described it there? We become like Jesus as we are equipped in the church to speak the truth in love to one another. The apostles had a place in all of this, but they're a part of a body that works together through those many parts. The work of making disciples of discipleship does not simply involve one individual. It involves the whole church working together. So, center point, what does that mean for us as a church, as a body of believers, as a body of disciples? I think it means that we need to make sure that our purpose as a church is God's purpose for the church. No matter what a church's mission statement might declare, and there's a lot of them out there, a lot of them are really trendy, a lot of them are really confusing, there are a lot of different missions for the church, but no matter what our mission declares, it has to be about the mission of God. It's easy to slip into other purposes as God's people. We can make church primarily about relationships or good Bible studies or social action or really good music. And those are all great things, but they're not the point. The famous last words of Jesus makes our mission clear. But it also means that we need to think carefully about how we, can, uh, how we carry out that mission. First, we need to acknowledge that becoming a disciple, growing as a disciple, involves many informal aspects. God uses casual conversations, difficult trials, times of prayer and reading, relationships, chances to serve one another, the things that we see, the things that we listen to. He uses all of these things in everyday life to help shape us into the disciples that He's called us to be. There are also more kind of informal and, the, you know, there are formal and informal aspects. You know, there are those things that we can plan for, those things that we can't plan for. The New Testament tells us that there are set times for Christians to meet together, even guidelines for worship and instruction. There were structures of leadership within the early church to provide teaching and oversight. There was often organization involved when it came to serving others in love. The appointed leaders 
uh, you know, through the laying, they, sorry, they appointed leaders through the laying on of hands. They remembered Christ through the elements of the Lord's Supper, which we celebrated here today. And they were guided in all of this by recognized and accepted sources of authoritative teaching. And those sources we still have today through the Word of God. I'm going to ask Zach if you want to come up. I told you it was going to be quick. It's good. So, are you ready today to follow his call? It's probably the most important thing. No, not probably. It is the most important thing happening in the universe right now. The most important work ever carried out. You can imagine the questions and fears and doubts that the 11 disciples would have had when Jesus said to them, go. We have these people, this was a, I mean, I, I joked this morning about it being kind of a ragtag morning. Uh, these disciples were a seriously ragtag group of guys. They were guys who didn't make the cut, first and foremost. What I mean by that is, uh, in Jewish culture, as I mentioned, they wanted to follow a rabbi, and this started very young. And what they would do is they would, the, the first couple of years, they were, they were about four years old. The first couple of years, their job was to, they would study under a rabbi, and studying the Torah. And in two years, a four-year-old had to memorize the first four books of the Bible. Can you guys imagine that? A four-year-old? Even a 10-year-old? Even a 33-year-old? <laughs> And so these people from a very young age knew what it was to be a disciple. And after that couple of years, they were essentially judged by whoever their rabbi was. So they've got like, a, say, a seven-year-old sitting in a room with this rabbi, and he basically says, sorry, you didn't make the cut. You weren't good enough. You weren't good enough to continue on studying under me. And so then those, the, the ones who were good enough, they would continue studying, and they would go a few more years learning a few more books of the Torah, and then same thing would happen. Rabbi would sit with them. You know, you've done this, and it's been great. You've done this, not so great. You get to come and continue to be my disciple. You, I know you're only seven, and I'm going to hurt your feelings, but sorry, you're not making the cut now. And when you think of the disciples... Where did Jesus find them? He didn't find them studying under a rabbi. He found them fishing, collecting taxes, killing people. If that is not a ragtag group of guys, I don't know what is. And so if Jesus can take these guys who in all forms of, of their culture just made no sense. If Jesus can take these guys and say to them, go, you're my disciples, now you're going to go and continue this work. If he can do that with them, how much more can he do with us if we're willing? And the thing that I love that I haven't addressed yet in this passage it's verse 18 and 19 and 20. It says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Behold, I am with you always. That right there, that is why a ragtag group of guys who kill people, who collect taxes, who cheat, who steal, that is how they can further the gospel. That is how they can make disciples. Not because they're awesome. Not because they're great. And it says in the beginning of the passage, some of them doubted. These guys studied with Jesus for three years. He told them many times, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to live. And when he appeared to them after coming back to life, some of them doubted. They didn't get it. Thomas wanted to put his hands in the side of Jesus to, to, so that he could believe that this truly was Jesus. 
And yet, God still used Thomas to make disciples, to further his kingdom. So church, to you individually and to you as a collective whole, I charge you with the same thing that Jesus charged each and every one of us with, to go, to make disciples of the nations, to make disciples of Montague, to make disciples of Belfast and even Georgetown. He's not just saying go out, you know, to Africa and do it there. It has to start here. It has to start in your community. It has to start in your home. I know many of us have people in our families who think we're crazy for joining with another group of ragtag people on a Sunday morning and worshiping this guy that we call Jesus. But we're called regardless of our situation, regardless of how great we feel. I know even when they asked me to preach, I said, there's no way I can do that. It's been over a year since I preached. I'm not worthy of that. But Jesus tells us here, I am with you always to the end of the age. So go into your homes, into your workplaces, and make disciples baptizing them and teaching them these decrees. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you are with us always. God, that through your power, we can carry out your mission to make disciples, to teach, to baptize, God, to love one another. Go with us from this place. God, as we worship in our homes and in our workspaces, help us be with us to the end of age as we share your word. In Jesus' name, amen.